Uh, this is <clears throat> unit four, part one. Unit four is on blood. And uh, we're going to discuss uh, some of the characteristics of the blood and the different components and its function and the function of this, uh, which is the body's only liquid organ. The blood is the body's only fluid tissue. It's made up of a fluid, liquid plasma, and what are called formed elements. They really refer to the cells, but there are some subcellular fragments, so the general term is formed elements. I want to remind you that plasma is the fluid part. If the blood is clotted, and the therefore the clotting factors have all been uh, removed from it because of the blood clot formation, then you get a liquid called serum. So serum and plasma are the same, but serum doesn't have the clotting factor proteins in it. Now those formed elements include the erythrocytes, or erythroid lineage cells, red blood cells, RBCs, the leukocytes, or white blood cells, and there's myeloid and lymphoid cells there, and platelets, which are derived from uh, small pieces of um, a large cell called a thrombocyte, uh, I'm sorry, a megakaryocyte, uh, which bleb off, these little bits bleb off, so it takes a little bit of, a, of a cell membrane from the megakaryocyte and some of that cytoplasm, and they form many, many, many very tiny platelets that are involved in the um, coagulation of blood. Now, one of the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, very commonly measured, uh, uh, one of the very one of the things that is very commonly measured in the blood uh, is the hematocrit, which is the percentage of red cells out of the total volume. What percent volume is red cells versus the total volume of the blood? This is done by taking a blood sample. Uh, Typically, it's taken, if it's in a tube, it's taken into a tube with an anticoagulant to prevent blood clotting from occurring. And then it's spun down, and you look at the overall percent by volume of the um, plasma as a percentage, so this amount, as a percentage of the total volume. And you can, and normally it's not done in a test tube like this, but in a very thin capillary tube. <clears throat> uh, just a th very thin, long uh, tube, maybe three inches long. So these are the uh, different steps. Uh, and, you know, there's a range of uh, normal. Uh, there's very few things that don't that have a single number associated with them. So normal values, uh, are, there's a range uh, in terms of normal values, and males typically have a slightly higher hematocrit than females. Blood is uh, a, a bright red if it's fully saturated with oxygen, and uh, if the oxygen saturation drops below 100% or 99.9%, it starts to get a, a darker red color. pH typically is 7.4 plus or minus 0 0.05, so 7.35 to 7.45. Body temperature is not uh, the same as uh, blood. The blood has a higher body temperature. You know, the blood is uh, constantly being pumped around and pumped through a muscle that's always active, always contracting. When muscles contract, they do generate uh, some heat. And uh, part of that is cooled off or carried away uh, by the blood as the blood passes through the heart. Whatever heat is generated there partially is taken away. And so you have a slightly higher temperature for the blood than the rest of the normal body temperature. So it's 38 degrees. It accounts for approximately 8% of total body weight. In males, it'll be five to six liters, depending upon the size of the male, 
four to five liters for females. You can get a large female and a small male, and the female will have more blood than the male. It, you know, there's a range. If you look at enough, then this is the typical kind of range that you get. What the blood does, it performs a number of uh, vital functions, including the distribution. It distributes throughout the body uh, key substances that are required for normal uh, me metabolic uh, fun and, and uh, physiological function, including oxygen and nutrients. It's involved in regulation uh, through hormone, uh, distribution of hormones and uh, uh, well there's a number of things but let's stick with hormones for now and protection in that it carries quite a few uh, immune cells in it uh, cells uh, that have non-specific and specific immune function and can protect the body there are other proteins uh, that are protective also in terms of distribution, as I said, the uh, oxygen from the lungs and nutrients from the GI tract will uh, get distributed uh, around the body. Uh, metabolic waste from cells gets moved to the lungs and the kidneys for elimination. In the lungs, you're going to get rid of uh, CO2. It's a metabolic waste product. And uh, in the kidneys, there's quite a bit of elimination of wa uh, waste molecules, uh, particularly nitrogen, but quite a few others. It also transports uh, hormones around the body from endocrine glands that secrete their product hormone into the bloodstream. And this way it gets distributed to target organs that have the target organs or tissues that have the right receptor for the particular hormone. It is involved in regulation. It helps maintain body temperature, normal pH and uh, volumes fluid volume. Remember you have um, a, um, you have to cool off if your body temperature gets too high and the blood helps do that by moving uh, more blood to the surface skin and, uh, there, and thereby radiating that uh, heat away at the top at your surface. Or it can help uh, conserve heat in your core by sending less blood to the surface skin and trying to preserve body temperature. Um, in terms of pH, the blood contains a important buffer, which is bicarbonate. So it helps to hold the pH within a normal range, 7.4 plus or minus 0.05. It's also an important uh, regulatory uh, player mechanism to make sure that volumes in the different uh, fluid compartments of the body are maintained. The blood is extracellular. It is the one of the two extracellular fluid compartments, the other one being the uh, interstitial fluid. So you have interstitial fluid and you have intravascular fluid. Interstitial is between the cells and the tissue. Intravascular is within the blood uh, vessels. And you have the intracellular volume, the fluid inside cells. But fluid can move between those compartments. And uh, one of the things that helps regulate uh, fluid volumes is, is an important protein found in the blood plasma called albumin. In terms of protection, there's uh, plasma proteins that are involved uh, in protecting you, uh, the complement proteins, uh, which you'll learn more about next year in microbiology and immunology. The antibody molecules that you find in the plasma are there. They also help protect um, platelets to prevent blood loss, uh, uh, clotting factors uh, to pr uh, prevent um, uh, loss of blood. Um, blood also protect, protects against infection. Well, okay, so here it's the antibody molecules that help protect you and complement and uh, also white blood cells that help defend against uh, foreign uh, microorganisms. I should have mentioned a few things I mentioned up here. Or all of this has to do with uh, the coagulation and clot formation and down here it's uh, to protect from blood loss and here 
to protect against infection. The blood plasma contains many solutes, among them some of the more important ones, certainly albumin, which I mentioned earlier. Albumin actually is the most common protein found in the blood plasma. It's more than, it's around 50% or slightly more than roughly 50% of the proteins in the plasma. There are also proteins uh, that are classified as globulins. The key ones that are important are the immunoglobulins. These are antibody molecules. You know, also have a whole series of clotting proteins, which you learned about, the different proteins that are involved in the clotting cascade. There are also a series of proteins called complement proteins that are involved in uh, defense mechanisms, and they have a similar kind of series of activations, similar in some ways to the clotting proteins, in that if you activate the first, then it'll activate the second, more, many of the second, which activate many of the third, etc. So it's called a cascade, like water cascading down a, from a small stream to a bigger one to a river. There are also non-protein nitrogenous substances, which are uh, in the blood plasma and will get eliminated in the urine. They include urea and creatinine. Uh, urea is a byproduct of uh, protein uh, breakdown, protein metabolism in the body. Uh, creat creatinine actually comes from an important molecule found in muscle tissue called uh, cre creatine phosphate um, and is constantly being released and released out of the urine as a waste product. There are other organic molecules like lactic acid, a byproduct of uh, anaerobic metabolism. Uh, anaerobic mechanisms for energy production produce lactic acid. It could be considered an organic nutrient in that whatever lactic acid is produced gets released from the cells, goes into the bloodstream, and ends up eventually in the liver where it gets converted into a nutrient called uh, uh, pyruvate. And as you know, pyruvate is, is uh, used for energy production. So lactic acid actually uh, acts in some ways as an organic nutrient. But you have all the other kind of nutrient uh, molecules that you would typically expect that cells need, including glucose and other carbohydrates and amino acids floating in the blood plasma. There are also electrolytes, charged ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, bicarb. All of these are electrolytes that are very important. Uh, to normal uh, function and the dissolved respiratory gases, oxygen that's picked up in the lungs and delivered to cells and CO2 that's picked up in the, from the cells and delivered to the lungs to be eliminated. And much of what I said is uh, described here. Uh, uh, not, there's some extra, you could read through it. It wouldn't hurt to, to you know, just uh, to, uh, I, I wouldn't ask directly necessarily uh, off this table, but you can read through it. So in terms of the formed elements in the blood, as I told you, there are red cells, there are white cells, and there are platelets. The uh, platelets are subcellular fragments of derived from megakaryocytes, and therefore these are called not cells but formed elements because they include a lot of platelets. But platelets are very tiny though, and so they don't they're not very obvious when you look at a smear of blood. When you look at the white cells, um, some sources, and I can't say that it's a very commonly used term, some sources call some cells agranulocytes because they don't have granules, and others granulocytes. That's uh, well, you know, I think it's it's really much better to talk about lymphoid lineage versus um, myeloid lineage. The granulocytes are part of the lymphoid lineage of cells. And there are three types, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, as you learned before and from the lab. 
<clears throat> and then there are also the other type of myeloid cells are monocyte macrophages. Monocytes in the blood, when they leave the bloodstream, go into tissues, are called macrophages. So these two groups, granulocytes and monocytes, are myeloid lineage cells, and lymphocytes form the lymphoid lineage cells. So I'll put a M here. These are myeloid, and these are the other type of myeloid lineage cells. And these here are the lymphoid lineage cells. So all these together are the granulocytes. The most common cell in the white blood cell in the, uh, in the blood are neutrophils. They'll form 50 to 70%. Then lymphocytes, 25% or more. Monocytes, uh, about 5% plus or minus two. And then eosinophils and basophils. Only the uh, white blood cells are complete cells. The red blood cells, they are cells, but they don't, a mature red cell does not have a nucleus. Uh, it does not have membrane bound organelles. And when you look at platelets, they are just uh, fragments all derived from uh, a very large cell called a megakaryocyte found in the bone marrow. Some of these, uh, many of them, only these white blood cells only last a few days, but some are quite long lived. Um, most cells, you know, this is so general, I, I, I don't even want to say it actually. I think it's an overgeneralization. The red blood cells and the mature granulocytes, they don't divide. Um, uh, the monocytes probably also don't, but the lymphoid cells do divide if activated. So uh, most red cells are constant, all the red, all the white cells and red cells are constantly being, you know, produced in the bone marrow, renewed from the bone marrow, new ones coming in. But many lymphoid cells are long lived in the periphery and uh, will divide if activated. And they get activated if they contact their target so this is what a, a smear of uh, peripheral blood looks like. You know it's blood because you see all those red cells and they don't have a nucleus. Um, remember the red blood cell is a biconcave disc. So the middle part is thinner. That's why it looks clearer white uh, looking in this photomicrograph. Um, the other cells that have a nucleus shown here are all white blood cells. As soon as you see a nucleus, you know it's a white blood cell. And over here, what you see are some clumped platelets. There are many platelets here, probably at least you know 15 platelets, all uh, attached, clumped. They're uh, very tiny. This is a monocyte. A characteristic uh, feature is that it has a kidney-shaped or horseshoe-shaped nucleus. That's how you recognize it. That's the characteristic uh, feature. Um, this is a lymphocyte. It has a uh, relatively small cyto amount of cytoplasm around the nucleus. The nucleus is more or less round. And these are neutrophils. They, the characteristic feature of this type of granulocyte uh, are that they have granules in the cytoplasm which are not darkly stained at all and the nuclei uh, for these the nucleus in each one is it looks like multiple but it's not these are lobes so there's a, there's a you know round section here for example uh, but there's one lobe but they're connected by a thin strip of of nuclear material to the next lobe and that's connected to this lobe and that's connected to that lobe so there's a multi-lobed nucleus and you can see the same kind of thing here what you have are multiple lobes uh, that all together form this uh, single nucleus that's a neutrophil 
and the alt, the other name for neutrophils uh, or the other and the other granulocytes also have this multi-lobed nucleus they differ from each other the eosinophil from the neutrophil from the basophil by the staining pattern of the of the granules in the cytoplasm so there you have it a uh, monocyte lymphocyte a couple of neutrophils there's some platelets clumped together and the rest are all red cells As you know, uh, red blood cells or erythrocytes are biconcave shaped discs. They don't have a nucleus. When they uh, are formed in the bone marrow um, uh, and not fully differentiated to mature red cells, they do have a nucleus, but that gets ejected before they go out into the peripheral blood. Um, they're essentially uh, bags of hemoglobin they're filled with the protein hemoglobin um, which uh, makes up more than 97 percent of the red cell uh, they are quite flexible and they have to be because they will travel through the capillaries uh, in single file capillaries are that narrow the uh, red blood cells uh, are in that sense a good example what I just described they're, they're a good example of the what's called the complementarity between structure and function they have a particular function because of their structure so they're very good at transporting gas and diffusion their biconcave shape gives them a very large surface area relative to their overall volume the um, one unusual aspect uh, compared to other cells about uh, the one particularly unusual thing about their metabolism is that they do need uh, ATP they can generate ATP but they do it anaerobically completely by um, lactic acid fermentation uh, as opposed to uh, oxidative phosphorylation they in that way don't consume any of the oxygen that they're transporting and deliver it uh, as they uh, they pick it pick it up and then we'll deliver it um, essentially they're a vehicle for transporting gas uh, delivering uh, oxygen to the tissues and picking up oxygen uh, carbon dioxide and bringing it to the lungs in many ways there's this uh, unusual dual role for hemoglobin it's it needs to be able to bind oxygen but it also needs to be able to release it so it reversibly binds oxygen um, most in fact most of the oxygen uh, in the blood is inside red cells bound to the hemoglobin the molecule itself is made up of uh, uh, four chains of the protein uh, of a protein called globin uh, there are two alpha chains and two beta chains I'm using the term chains uh, although um, uh, they're not the the the, the strands uh, the four strands of uh, globin protein are not held together by disulfide bonds um, but there are two alpha chains and two beta chains and each one has at its center a heme group so there are four heme groups uh, and each heme has a uh, atom of iron at its center and it's the iron at the center of the uh, each of the globin chains that binds one molecule of oxygen thus a molecule of hemoglobin will be able to transport when fully saturated can transport four molecules of oxygen and here you see a diagram showing the uh, four chains here uh, uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2 and uh, beta 1 and beta 2 and these this flat flat disc uh, object is a heme molecule at the center of each of the globin chains and this is a blow up of the heme 
and the heme group and with the iron at the center that can bind oxygen. Well, uh, there are some terms that are used uh, to characterize the uh, gases associated with hemoglobin. Uh, if the hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it, it's called oxyhemoglobin. Uh, if it's uh, free of hemoglobin, it's called the deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, and if it has CO2 bound to it, which uh, does happen, it's called carbaminohemoglobin. Having said that, it's normally that you don't use these particular terms. You don't hear them that often. Essentially, we talk about hemoglobin as uh, how saturated is the hemoglobin. Is it fully saturated or partially saturated with oxygen? So in terms of production of the red cells, they uh, form in the bone marrow by a process called hematopoiesis, which is blood cell formation. It uh, occurs in the red bone marrow. You have red bone marrow in particular parts of the skeleton in the axial skeleton and uh, girdles, the, uh, particularly the uh, ends of the uh, humerus and the femur, and also in the uh, sternum. The <clears throat> um, Hematopoiesis actually uh, refers to blood formation, all different kinds of blood cell formation. Uh, formation of red cells in particular is called erythropoiesis. Um, the cell that gives rise to all the different types of formed elements or different types of cells that are in the blood is the blood stem cell. And that is called a hemocytoblast. So there's a primitive, poorly, not differentiated at all, hemocytoblast in the bone marrow that can give rise to all the different lineages, types. And, you know, these are determined which one direction, which of the many possible directions is determined by the feedback uh, signals that it's getting, that the cells are getting. Here you see the process and the chain of uh, different uh, development along the line of differentiation of red cells, the process of erythropoiesis, starting with the hemocytoblast. If the cell, if the stem cell gets committed towards producing red cells, then it'll go through these different stages and you have uh, proliferation and differentiation. It differentiates into each of the different sequential stages and proliferates along the way until it finally gets to the end stage and uh, red blood cells, a mature red cell is produced and released into the peripheral blood from the bone marrow. I don't need you to know all the different uh, stages, uh, just the first stem cell and the last erythrocyte in the periphery. Um, <clears throat> you can see the process here of the ejection of the nucleus just before uh, the cell gets released into the peripheral blood. So the process is, as I said, called erythropoiesis. Um, and it goes through a series of events, a series of um, transformations called uh, differentiation towards that mature red cell. Um, you get a lot of buildup of the protein hemoglobin inside and the Nucleus gets ejected, and then uh, and then you have erythrocytes. The stage just before uh, they get released into the periphery is called are they're called reticulocytes. And if a person has had a major bleed and is short on red cells and is therefore producing a lot of red cells, sometimes you'll see reticulocytes in the peripheral blood. And that's an indicator that they're producing a lot of red cells to try and replace lost red cells. Okay. Well, um, in terms of regulation of uh, erythropoiesis, the uh, body tries to keep a constant, uh, overall constant number of red cells. 
And so there's a balance always between red cell production and red cell destruction. Red cells, after all, do not live forever. They do get older and they'll be uh, actually phagocytosed and taken up by macrophages, typically in the uh, spleen. Um, so red cells are aging, uh, constantly getting removed. New ones are being produced. If there are too few red cells in the blood, then it'll lead to uh, a lower oxygen level in the tissues, so you can get tissue hypoxia. If there are too many, then you get the blood becomes too thick, it's uh, too high a viscosity. So it has to be at a proper, within a proper normal range in order to do, have adequate uh, oxygenation of the tissues and not to be too uh, viscous or too thick because the, there's so many red cells, the hematocrit rises too high and the blood gets too thick. The process is actually hormonally controlled. Uh, it's uh, dependent on uh, adequate supplies of all the different amino acids to uh, put together uh, the globin molecules and also availability of iron for the heme. Uh, B vitamins are uh, important in uh, uh, adequate production of uh, red blood cells. And it also requires a hormone called erythropoietin, which I'll describe in the next few slides. So the hormonal control is uh, determined actually uh, from, by the kidneys. Kidney, there's tissue in the kidney that's constantly monitoring the oxygen level. And if there is uh, low oxygen or hypoxia, uh, because of either because of decreased uh, red blood cells or decreased oxygen availability, which can happen for many reasons, or an increased uh, demand of the tissue for oxygen, a chronic increase in demand for oxygen, then that will trigger uh, release of this hormone, uh, erythropoietin, from uh, the kidneys. And that uh, goes into the circulation and uh, is, uh, can act on uh, hemocytoblasts within the red bone marrow to uh, trigger them to start developing towards the erythropoietic line of production of red cells, uh, differentiation, multiplication differentiation towards uh, red cells. So that will trigger enhanced erythropoiesis and the red blood cell count uh, will increase and the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood increases and that's detected by the kidneys and uh, resulting in a drop in erythropoietin production as the oxygen carrying capacity rises to proper levels. Now um, it's not instant, it's not overnight, it takes uh, days to weeks uh, with uh, you know in response but it will respond to uh, the body normally would respond, the kidneys will respond by releasing erythropoietin, which will act on the hemocytoblasts in the red bone marrow. This is a diagram that shows that kind of uh, feedback mechanism where uh, this level uh, indicates this uh, straight, uh, flat, uh, level bar indicates normal blood vessels, uh, normal blood oxygen levels, but if it drops, then it's a case of hypoxia, and uh, that is um, uh, detected. The decreased, uh, decrease in oxygen availability is detected in the kidney tissue that can produce and release erythropoietin, and that acts on the bone marrow to trigger uh, hemocytoblasts to produce red cells, so you get erythropoiesis, and then the uh, because of the increase in the red blood cell count, in other words, the uh, hematocrit rises, there will be a return to normal, hypo uh, normal oxygen levels. Uh, the hypoxia is corrected and there's a negative feedback so that the uh, kidneys stop at that point uh, producing uh, more erythropoietin than normal.
Well, as I told you, red cells do not live forever. They have an average lifespan of 100 to 120 days, and old ones become less flexible. They're more rigid and fragile. Hemoglobin begins to degenerate. It's a protein molecule. It doesn't stay last forever. The uh, aged red cells be, are phagocytosed by macrophages, as I said, mainly in the spleen. Uh, and the uh, macrophages then engulf, take them in, and the heme and the globin are, uh, get the hemoglobin inside the red, aged red cells gets broken down inside the uh, phagosome. Uh, heme and globin are separated. The globin, that protein, is broken down into its individual amino acids so that they can be reused. And the heme gets broken down. The iron is, is salvaged. It's, for, it's salvaged for reuse. The body very rarely gives up uh, um, iron. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, the body does not give up its uh, any iron within it uh, easily at all. Iron, uh, uh, we uh, developed uh, through evolution uh, with always, a, you know, iron being a difficult uh, a nutrient to get. So we have uh, quite a few um, uh, fairly elaborate systems to make sure that all iron is always held tightly within the body. Well, <clears throat> um, as the, you know, as I said, the hemoglobin gets broken down, separated into globin, which gets chopped up into amino acids, individual amino acids, as it says here. And the heme is, uh, gets degraded through a fairly intricate series of biochemical conversions to a molecule called uh, bilirubin. And the liver secretes bilirubin into the intestines uh, as bile. And that contains the bile salts that, that's part of the bile salts that are involved in uh, uh, fat absorption. So there's a cycle of uh, secretion and uh, recycling of the uh, bilirubin, which originates from that uh, degraded uh, heme. And uh, this is actually quite a good diagram. It, it goes through what I've been discussing up until now, uh, showing the life cycle, showing that uh, low oxygen levels, in other words, tissue hypoxia, uh, will stimulate the kidneys to produce erythropoietin and gets released into the bloodstream and acts on the uh, bone marrow hemocytoblast to trigger uh, increase in erythropoiesis, production of red cells. And the mature red cells leave the bone marrow and will function uh, normally in the uh, in the circulation for about 100 to 120 days. At which point they are aged and damaged, the hemoglobin is breaking down, so they get engulfed by uh, macrophages, phagocytose by macrophages, mainly in the spleen actually. And the hemoglobin in those red cells that were taken up by macrophages gets broken down. The globin part, which is the protein part, gets broken into amino acids that gets released back as available nutrients to into the bloodstream uh, for as, as nutrients for other cells to be able to take up. And the heme uh, will be processed into bilirubin that goes into making um, bile. Uh, and, uh, and that goes into the uh, gallbladder and gets released into the duodenum. Um, some of that uh, bile that goes into the duodenum actually gets broken down by bacteria uh, through a series of conversions into a molecule called stercobilin. Okay, and it's excreted in the feces. So some of it does get excreted, but some gets taken up with fat as you learned uh, because the bile salts will 
um, will um, what's the word I'm looking for will um, emulsify fat and then get taken up in the gut that's how fat gets taken up stercobilin by the way not surprisingly uh, is brown so stercobilin the product of bacterial action on bilirubin uh, gets excreted in the feces uh, the iron uh, from the heme is trans uh, is is bound up to a molecule called transferrin that goes into the blood making it available for um, uh, more uh, erythropoiesis you know delivering that iron uh, in the form of uh, iron bound to transferrin delivering it to different cells not just the bone marrow but there are many other cells that require iron uh, as part of um, uh, molecules the protein molecules that they make there are many uh, non they're called non-heme uh, iron containing proteins okay are there disorders of red blood cells yes there are many uh, there are some uh, anemia is a very general term there are many different kinds of anemia and we'll go through a few of them just the basics of it uh, anemia refers to uh, abnormally low blood carrying capacity of the blood it's a symptom it's not a disease itself um, if the oxygen blood levels of oxygen uh, cannot support no, normal metabolism then it's uh, the person is anemic typical signs include the uh, fatigue uh, paleness shortness of breath chills uh, in a person who has anemia um, if the anemia is due to an insufficient number of erythrocytes it could be because it's uh, hemorrhagic anemia which is the result of uh, loss of blood bleeding which could be acute or chronic uh, if um, the insufficient numbers are due to hemolysis then it's hemolytic anemia this is the premature uh, lysis or rupture of red cells before they've reached uh, you know 120 days uh, lifespan they're already starting to to lyse uh, another type of anemia which is quite serious is called aplastic anemia and that's uh, associated with uh, uh, failure of the red bone marrow to uh, thrive and produce blood cells so you get destruction or inhibition of that red bone marrow and that's aplastic anemia all of these can lead to insufficient numbers of red cells hemorrhagic anemia hemolytic anemia or aplastic anemia some anemias are due to uh, decreased hemoglobin content the cells are there the red cells are there but they don't have enough hemoglobin inside them it could be because of uh, iron deficiency so iron deficiency anemia uh, would as a result of hemorrhagic anemia you know it's a secondary thing to hemorrhage if you're bleeding too much you lose too much iron out of your body and you get an iron deficiency anemia but that's secondary to hemorrhagic anemia or it may be that you're not getting enough iron in uh, uh, a person's not getting enough iron in their diet or they uh, are getting iron but uh, they can't absorb it for some uh, reason because of some pathological problem in the gastrointestinal tract uh, another type of anemia that results in a decreased hemoglobin inside the red cells is called pernicious anemia and this is because of a deficiency of vitamin b12 i would remind you that uh, the stomach produces um, a, a product called a molecule called intrinsic factor it gets secreted uh, by the glands in the stomach and it's uh, needed for uh, absorption of vitamin b12 from the gut into the body if the person lacks uh, intrinsic factor then they can't absorb the b12 and the treatment for that is simply uh, 
injection of uh, vitamin B12 directly into that person. Okay, another kind of anemia, and these are genetically based uh, disease, diseases uh, in which the uh, hemoglobin is abnormal. The molecules of hemoglobin produced are abnormal, and the two main types uh, are, and there are several different types of thalassemia, but the one major type of abnormal hemoglobin are the, is called thalassemia. The disease is called th thalassemia, and the other one is sickle cell anemia. In thalassemia, you have either a absent or faulty globin chain within the hemoglobin, and in sickle cell anemia, there's a, uh, and these are genetically based diseases, as I told you. In sickle cell anemia, what you have is a, uh, the gene that codes for the hemoglobin is uh, coding for abnormal uh, hemoglobin. It's because of a uh, mutation resulting in what's called hemoglobin S. The uh, red cells actually uh, look quite normal. However, when the PO2 drops below normal levels, and PO2 does drop more uh, when there's an increased demand for oxygen, then the uh, hemoglobin S inside the red cells starts to uh, crystallize, essentially. And uh, it forces a uh, change in the shape of the cell. The cell becomes... Uh, this kind of curved sickle shape. A sickle is a, is a knife that's curved like that. It's used for, this is the handle. Let's make the handle darker. This is the handle, and there's the uh, blade in yellow. And uh, so that's a, that is a sickle. And here you see that uh, in the shape of this r red cell, it's sickle shaped. So this is called sickle cell anemia. Um, in low oxygen conditions, just when you need uh, more oxygen, uh, because of the low oxygen, the hemoglobin S changes within the red cell and it becomes, it changes into this uh, curved, more rigid shape. And uh, these individuals, uh, the, these red cells do not easily move through the capillaries and these individuals can be uh, quite sick and can it can be uh, uh, quite a deadly disease process okay another type of uh, uh, abnormality uh, with red cells is called polycythemia in polycythemia what you have is an excess in the red cells and that uh, is the are in such high numbers, the hematocrits go so high that there's actually a uh, potentially dangerous increase in blood viscosity. There are different types of polycythemia. The main ones are polycythemia vera, which is a genetically based disease. There is secondary polycythemia. By secondary means that there's some other process that's gone wrong that's triggering the polycythemia. This could be due to tissue hypoxia. For example, if you go move to a higher altitude, the ambient atmospheric PO2 is lower than normal and that will trigger, uh, that'll end up causing tissue hypoxia and trigger the kidneys to produce more erythropoietin. So you get a higher than normal hematocrit. Uh, so that's uh, polycythemia due to uh, tissue hypoxia. It's secondary polycythemia. And the third main type of polycythemia is due to blood doping. So uh, I think we'll stop here. This is the um, last slide of um, Unit 4, Part 1.